slides. Hello. Hey, Jacob. How are you guys? I'm doing all right. You sound a little hoarse, or maybe I just haven't talked to you in a while. No, no, no hoarseness. Maybe it's my headphones. I, I was like saying to myself, should I put on a less less big pair of headphones for the for the phone call? But whatever. <laughs> no, it, it looks great. Um and hi Dina. I don't think hi. I don't you. Uh, have you you have you guys oh let's do some quick intros, Dina. Hi hey, Jacob, I'm Dina. I um, work as a data analyst in the of educator preparation pipelines and I work with Jerry. Welcome everybody. I'm so excited that you all could join us for um, our fifth um, education policy brown bag um, series that is hosted by um, Circle, a center here at Texas Tech as well, the educational leadership policy faculty. Um, this is our first brown bag of the spring semester, and I am very excited to introduce our guest speakers. Um, Dr. Landa and Dr. Gawazi, and you can please correct me, Dean, if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Um, I'm just going to give a quick intro and then turn it over to our speakers um, for what is sure to be a really exciting talk, particularly given that the legislative session just started today. Um, and many people are going to be talking about the issues that um, Jeremy and Dean are going to be talking about today. So um, Dr. Landa is the Director of Educator Data Research and Strategy for Educator Preparation, Certification, and Enforcement at the Texas Education Agency, or TEA. He has his Master's in Education from Harvard University and his PhD in Leadership, Learning, and Education Policy from the University of Connecticut. He has previously published research studies in the areas of teacher leadership, principal learning, and focus on the impact of a state-level financial aid incentive to boost the labor supply of teachers of color. Dr. Dina Gowazi is a data analyst at the Texas Education Agency. She was previously a postdoctoral research fellow with the University of Houston's Education Research Center. She earned her PhD in higher education leadership and policy studies at the University of Houston. And her research interests focus on international student engagement and success factors. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dina and Jeremy to correct anything I may have um, said in, uh, inaccurately in your bios and um, get us started with our talk on new teacher hires. Thanks, Jacob, for uh, the introductions. I feel like I, th I think that might be my first uh, formalized introduction like that, so I can check that box off my uh, my bucket list. Um, uh, so so I'll we're going to do some brief intros and then our first slide. We actually talk a little bit about our division and what we do on a regular basis. But uh, I am Jeremy Landa. All the things that that you did share are correct, Jacob. And uh, I'll I'll let Dina you go. Hi everyone, I'm Dina Gazawi, and I've been a data analyst here at TEA uh, since March of 2022. Um, and I am very excited to be presenting our work today. And, and today we're gonna to be talking about new teacher hires, examining the pathways into and out of teaching. Next slide here. So, uh, who are we and what do we actually do on a regular basis? Uh, this this presentation is in our, our kind of regular work stream. Um, we are part of the Educator Data Research and Strategy Division. Uh, the three people you see on the slide are the three people that have been the contributors to this, this work stream. Um, our work is, is to provide all data support, though, for the Educator Certification Preparation and Enforcement Department. So that includes analytical leadership, it's supporting issues related to ongoing work initiatives. Uh, you might recognize our work. I think some of the core things we do include uh, producing all the data related to the accountability system for educator preparation, um, which I know everyone is thrilled to hear about. And we're, we're, we're about to uh, pass along our recommendations for the current year. Um, to jump into 
our agenda today, we'll talk a little bit about the motivation for this work. Uh, we'll share some empirical information, evidence here on new hires and where, where do they come from in, in Texas. Uh, and then Dina will add some, some retention and reentry related uh, analysis, talking about the sources of new hires and reenters and uh, their timing and retention. And we'll finish up with some discussion. So to kind of jump jump into the meat here, so uh, I think everyone is well aware that this is true, but teacher labor markets have been uh, firmly in the middle of media and research spotlights for the last couple of years. The, the pandemic really, I think, exacerbated what was an ongoing thing. Uh, media picked up, and as you can see from these headlines, uh, really sensationalized and, and talked a lot about what might be a mass exodus. I'm not sure those were totally accurate in, in where they were going, but they did surface an ongoing issue. Researchers have at least picked up on uh, the, the urgency of this issue. And there's been a whole bunch of work over the last couple of years that I think has advanced what we're knowing and learning about teacher vacancies, which is kind of where this, this work uh, is, is adjacent at least. And so I, I'm just citing a couple of different things that advancements here, including uh, there's been some work identifying state level data infrastructure problems just to measure supply or demand. Uh, there's been work building a national vacancy and under credentialing database that's been ongoing. There's been work scraping job postings to describe duration and quantity of, of those listings by subject. And there's been some new work looking at vacancy data and trying to uh, look for independent variables or predictors of those vacancies. Uh, TEA has also been engaged with these issues, most prominently through the Teacher Vacancy Task Force. Uh, there is a website, so if you are really interested and haven't been following any of that, uh, you just search the Texas Teacher Vacancy Task Force, you will find a whole bunch of information here. Uh, this task force has, has done these four kind of broader things and is in the recommendation uh, writing phase right now. Uh, and I believe if I remember right, those will be posted in February. Um, the kind of the broad brushstroke issues that the task force has been talking about and addressing, uh, it, it's three prong. One prong is compensation. One prong is support and training. And the last prong is working conditions. So there will be recommendations coming out of that task force that will very likely uh, enmesh themselves and get get kind of firmly in the middle of the legislative uh, session. And, and we may see some legislation that comes out of those task force recommendations. Uh, the EDRS EPSI team, so the team that I mentioned earlier, uh, my team uh, has been providing a whole bunch of supports throughout that teacher vacancy task force process. Uh, I highlight four of them that are related to this work. So one is we we built a new data set that links our new sources to the sources uh, that kind of get them to the workforce. Frequently that's preparation, but not always. Uh, we've improved our, using that data set, we improved some uh, regular reporting we do. We've also built a new dashboard from this data set, which is just, I, I believe we just, turned it live like an hour ago. Um, and we've disseminated and discussed a whole bunch of findings internally and externally, including today, uh, to talk about what we're finding in this data. Um, to jump into the first piece of this empirical work, so that I'm gonna do just some basic non-inferential non description of uh, new hires in the state of Texas. Um, so. To kind of get to some findings here, uh, we, we draw on a couple of different data sources to build a panel of data. So the first data source comes out of the Public Education Information Management System, or PEMS, as many people know, which is a uh, self-reported data 
set, set of data that comes out of the local education agencies in Texas. The employment data is collected in October at the October snapshot of each year. And this data set is built. The, the basic premise is we look for people who were employed in year T and not employed in year T minus one as a teacher. We add in some information that comes out of our educate, educator certification online system. Uh, specifically, we looked in this system for any first certification or permit that was observed and merged that data into our employment data. We also used the existing information to back into two uh, additional pieces of information in the employment data. The first is for people who have no certification or permit of record in Texas. The second is for people who were, were calling re-enterers, but people who were a teacher at, at some point in time disappear from our data as a teacher and then reappear in the data as a teacher at least one, at minimum one, with, with a break of one year. So through this process, we built a panel that runs from 2009, panel of data from 2009 to 2009, 2010 school year to 21, 22 school year. This includes 497,000-ish uh, individual new hires. And so first, first to kind of describe this over the last decade plus, uh, we see about 8 to 10% of the workforce in each year is a new hire. Again, that being someone who was a teacher of record in the current year, who was not a teacher of record in the previous year. Uh, this is a bit, pretty big number uh, when 8 to 10% of our workforce is anywhere, as you can see, from 24,000 up to 43,000, uh, just some some interesting patterns to point out here. In 2011, 2012, we see a big dip that corresponds with TARP money running out and a whole bunch of schools needing to uh, reduce their workforce size. Uh, thereafter, we see a jump up, up to 37,000. And basically after that point, it remains steady, if not increasing a little bit over the, the next eight to 10 years. Uh, the last school year was that we had the greatest number of new hires that we've measured up to this point. So that was for about 43,000 new hires in the state. Uh, kind of a high level and an important thing to note before we move into some more empirical uh, findings here. It, so examining newly hired teachers through this work requires requires us to examine more than newly certified teachers. I think it's not an uncommon thing for people to just think that new hires are new certif newly certified. They're new, brand new to the workforce. Uh, and so like thinking about a pipeline at large, we typically just think about these two pieces of the pipeline, but there are actually two other pieces that we we think are pretty important, uh, at least in Texas. One group is the no certification or permit group. The second group is our re-entering teacher workforce group. And if we look at the 21-22 school year, uh, we can see why, why uh, Dina and I and our team might be saying this. So uh, in 21-22, over half of the new hires either were re-entering or had no certification, but you can see there are big buckets, uh, these kind of five big buckets, four of them are, are pretty large in size uh, across the re-entering re group. You have your alternative certification group, which tends to, is mostly just people who are interns in the system. You have the traditional certification group who are doing a who have clinical teaching experience before they enter the workforce. You have the no certification group, and you also have a small group of out-of-state certified teachers. Jeremy, can I ask, who is the non, I because I was going to assume the permit folks were that non-certification group, but you're 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 including them in the alt cert. Who's in that non-certification group? 
done if we don't see any type of uh, certification or permit uh, in our educator certification system, but they appear in employment data. Um, the the uh, emergency permit group, it is anyone who is get who is issued a SBEC emergency certificate. So we still don't. Uh, I see that question. We still don't know about District of Innovation people. That's going to be included in the no certified group. Uh, there are district local permits. That's going to be included in the no certified group. Um, is there anything else? Uh, no, I, I mean, the the other big space where like charter schools are, are, are a big player in that space too. Um, but I, I, essentially the key qualification here is we're looking for any type of certification that the SBEC is the primary, is the issuer for. And if we don't see anything that ends up getting lumped into that no certified category. Uh, when we look back, so we look across this panel, we can kind of see a couple of interesting patterns as well. So like at, at the high level, we know that certification policy is evolving over time. We also know that uh, economic trends do affect hiring or, or demand for new teachers. Um, the, the, I think the two things that are really interesting about this over time, one, is the no, certif certif no certification group grows across this panel. So it's not terribly big. When we look all the way back to 2009 and 10, it's pretty big when we look at the last school year that we have data for. Um, to the points, uh, to your question just before here, Jacob, and I think it was Levi who made made the point about districts of innovation. Districts of innovation happen somewhere in the middle of this panel and is becoming an increasingly used lever, especially when condition labor market conditions are tight. So that I think that's one thing to just kind of point out. The second piece here, as no certification group grows, the traditional certification pathway is not not rapidly diminishing, but it is diminishing. And so to kind of recap what what I've walked us through with these non inferential descriptives. Uh, so our no certification group is small. It's previously been unreported by our team, and it's a growing group of new hires in recent years. You have your alt cert pathway, which is large and steady at this point. Uh, you have your reentry pathway, which is large, steady, and previously unreported also. We have the out-of-state preparation pathway, which is a small group, small and steady group of your new hires, and your undergraduate or traditional certification, which is a large but declining share. This, All of this has raised a couple of additional questions that Dean is about to tackle for you. Uh, the first question is, of those who are new hires, which sources remain and for how long? Second question we had is, do any teacher EPP or LEA characteristics predict who exits? And finally, do any teacher EPP or LEA characteristics predict who returns to teaching after an exit? And I'll turn it over to Dina. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so I'm gonna start by talking about our data sources and, sa and sample, uh, Jeremy, gave a great description of the data that we used. We used a longitudinal data set, which includes new teacher hires by preparation pathway in Texas. And we used a, the, we limited the data to the time frame of 2010 to 2022. We combined our employment data with certification information from our ecosystem. Um, the number of, to, uh, the total number of individual teachers uh, includes um, 307,783, and we have almost 1.3 total observations because our data was constructed as a person period data set. So it was um, employed, so basically we had 1.3 million employment records. The groups that we omitted were teachers with no record of first year employment during the timeframe studied. So we only included 
uh, teachers who whose first year of employment was either 2010 or after 2010. So for our data analysis uh, methods, we use the analytical technique of discrete time survival analysis, where events occur in distinct periods of time, and we're examining the time to event occurrence, which in this case is either remaining or leaving teaching. The way our data set was constructed was a person period data set, where each record represented a particular year that a teacher was observed as employed or not employed from 2010 to 2022. Um, we uh, looked at spells, teaching spells. Um, so teachers in our data set can be in one of four states. One is, the first is not yet employed in, in public schools. The second is for their first spell in teaching. The third is their first exit out of teaching. And this includes um, those who exit the teaching profession um, as a whole or switched roles into a non-teaching role. So we count exit as both those things and their first re-entry into teaching. Um, so for our regression analysis, we used a Cox proportional hazard model, um, which is unique in the sense that it extends survival analysis to simultaneously examine the effect of several covariates on survival time. So I gave just a general equation of this model where T or um, T represents our survival time, the hazard of, of time represents the hazard function or a fit the failure function according to a set of covariates, which I will describe next. We have our um, B coefficients that represent the effect size of each of our covariates. And then we have the baseline hazard, which is the value of the hazard if all our covariates are equal to zero. And I just wanna highlight that the very um, valuable um, uh, feature of this uh, model is the fact that covariates can change over time and we can see the effect of these changing covariates on our survival time. So um, I'm just going to briefly describe our independent variables. Um, we used period. First of all, there was a period var variable, which is a categorical variable representing 13 periods or years in which a teacher was observed from 2010 to 2022. Um, we have a region variable, which re represents one of the 20 education service centers in Texas where a teacher is employed. We have a local, uh, our local education agency geographic setting, which is a TEA design uh, assigned district type variable. It groups districts, school districts into eight uh, distinct categories that ranges from major urban to rural to, rural to charter districts. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that the inclusion of this um, variable of geographic setting um, comes from uh, supporting uh, literature and research that, support, uh, that, that shows correlation between geographic setting and, uh, and um, certification category. For example, we found that rural teachers, uh, rural schools hire a higher share of uncertified teachers, whereas the major urban and suburban districts are more likely to hire intern certified teachers. Same with the inclusion of race ethnicity, uh, research finds that black teachers in particular are more likely to be uh, trained in alternative certification. So we, we do have um, supporting evidence that this is a uh, important variable to include in our analysis. We also have gender and we have certification category. And what we mean in this particular analysis is the first observed certification attained by a teacher and that ranges, it's a categorical variable that includes standard certified teachers, intern certified, out of state certified, no certification and emergency permit. So just to give you a high level uh, um, description or summary of our results before going into the details. Um, so we have three key uh, results that we found. One is that standard certified teachers are more likely to be retained compared to our other new hire sources. Second, that teachers of color are more likely to be retained compared to white teachers. And finally, uh, teachers in independent school districts are more likely to be retained compared to teachers in charter school districts. So um, for our first finding, 
uh, certified teachers are more likely to be retained in their first years of five years of teaching compared to teachers without a certification. So I want to just highlight that this is the mo our, our primary model that just includes certificate that just basically examines the survival time by certification category. We're going to look at the full model with all of our covariates next, but this is just the preliminary model with certification category. So the big takeaway is that we see that certification, um, certified teachers are more likely to be retained, but in specific, there are variation between, there's variation within certification categories. In particular, a higher per, um, percent of standard certified teachers are retained by their five years of teaching, 68%. We look at um, intern certified teachers, 56% of them are retained by their fifth teaching year and 32% of uncertified teachers are retained by their fifth year of teaching. And we can see these, um, these, uh, the difference between the certification categories in our um, survival curve, where we see that the red dashed line of standard certified teachers is way above the no certification line at the very bottom, which is in yellow. Tina, can I ask one clarifying question? Sure. So you're, you're the, the, I guess the hazard is leaves, like the spell of leaving teaching entirely, not like moving to a different district. So if you, if I, I guess what I'm saying is if I'm start as a teacher in year one in one district and I move to another district in year two, that's not a, no. that's not right. I'm still in, okay, cool. You're, you're still considered uh, a teacher if you move districts or you move schools um, or you move regions, but you're not considered, uh, you're considered a, a lever if you, for example, switch from your teacher role to a, another an, an administrative role or a non-teaching role in the same school, you, you can, you're considered to be a lever. So our next uh, slide, this actually is the full model, uh, represents the full model of our, uh, survival analysis or our Cox proportional hazards model. So this shows us the coefficient plots of uh, certification category after controlling for all of our covariates. Um, so what we find is that teachers without a Texas certification are almost three times more likely to leave teaching compared to those with the standard certification. And this is after controlling for, our, um, for the different covariates listed. We also plot the same for the same model. We plot, we plot the coefficients for race, ethnicity. And what we find is that Black and Hispanic teachers are more likely to be retained compared to white teachers. In specific, uh, Hispanic teachers are 17% less likely to leave compared to white teachers. And Black teachers are 6% likely to leave, um, less likely to leave compared to white teachers. We also plotted um, uh, the odds ratios for uh, a local education agency geographic setting. Um, we see that uh, teachers in all independent school districts are more likely to be retained compared to those in charter school districts. We also see um, in this uh, plot that we see major urban and rural district findings, they echo research findings that show that they have the highest turnover rates. So we see our rural and um, major urban districts with the highest turnover rates. Um, we also see that our um, non-metropolitan fast-growing districts uh, have the least turnover rates. So just to recap our, uh, our um, model conclusions, First is that certification matters. We, we see and we're trying to increase the understanding that different certification categories are in fact related to teacher retention. Um, second, teachers of color are better retained. There's a lot more to unpack here. Um, it's, it's a very interesting finding, but of course this is, um, this is the first step to increasing our understanding of, of this particular finding and there's room for more research in this topic. Um, finally, geographic setting matters. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to increase our understanding of the relationship between certification categories and geographic setting. 
So moving on to the next part of our analysis. So we, we examined the extent to which teachers leave or the extent to which they're retained in teaching. Now we're gonna look at to what extent to teachers who leave teaching eventually return to teaching. So we use the same data set um, to investigate the probability of re-entry among exiting teachers. But what we did was we reduced this data set to include this population of exiting teachers. So teachers who left uh, the profession, um, and that again includes those who left the, the teaching entirely um, or left education entirely or uh, moved from teaching to uh, another non-teaching role. So it includes both of those uh, populations. Um, and our, this sample of exiting teachers is 123,332 and includes those um, individuals, as I said, who return and remain. Um, and so our, our, the way that we uh, constructed this analysis is that time begins when teachers exit the profession and ends when they return to teaching. So it was also a person period uh, data set. We investigated the cumulative hazard rate of teachers re-entering the profession or the cumulative failure rate. And we also then extended this analysis to look at the probability of retention among re-entering teachers. So basically once teachers return to teaching after their exit, how long do they stay? Um, and we did this using Kaplan-Meier survival curve. So um, as Jeremy described at the beginning of this presentation, re-enters have been a significant and stable source of, of new teacher hire since 2010. We, we investigated longitudinal patterns of the proportion of re-enters compared to new hires, and we can see that they've been growing and they've been a stable source of supply. Looking at our first set of survival curves that, um, uh, that investigate time to re-entry. Uh, so basically what we see is that certified teachers are more likely to return to teaching than teachers without certifications. Specifically, standard certified teachers, 44% of standard certified teachers return to teaching after leaving for five years compared to 36% of intern certified teachers and 22% of uncertified teachers. Next, we look at the retention of re-enters. So once they've returned, how, how, what, to what extent are they um, remaining in the profession? Um, so we found that certified teachers, again, are more likely to be retained after their re-entry into teaching compared to those without certifications. And again, we see variation among the certification categories. So once standard certified teachers return to teaching, 50% of them are retained by their fifth year in teaching, um, compared to 44% of intern certified teachers and 32% of uncertified teachers. And to conclude, or to give you just um, overall conclusion from this set, this set of uh, models, um, we see that certification is related to the probability of retention among teachers. And we also see that there is variation in this, in this probability among different certification categories. And finally, we see that certification is related to the prob probability of teachers being retained after re-entry. And I will hand it back over to Jeremy. So, so some... Uh some high level conclusions and then we'll we'll get down to some specific ones so kind of at the high level like what the contribution of this work has been is that we're working through at least internally developing a new teacher pipeline heuristic or way of thinking to help leadership understand who's showing up into the workforce uh and thus it will help i we we hope and believe it, it's going to help leadership think carefully about the initiatives where where they're meeting needs where they might be falling short um we also as a result of just this work have developed a much stronger infrastructure to continue driving this work forward a data infrastructure that is um i i think the last piece like just to kind of highlight is we as a result of having all this information now 
we've had to work through and develop better theoretical and empirical models that are going to just help us uh, as we move forward, uh, think about everything from what do we know and don't know about the pipeline to uh, if there's missing information, are there ways that we can we can collect that or are there ways we can have conversations uh, with the field, with researchers to, to try to find uh, ways to better inform our understanding of these different groups that we've uh, identified. Next slide here. Uh, so we have a couple of, I think, pretty obvious next steps for our work. One is we just need to continue tracking our new hires over time in a more systematic way than we have been previously and reporting on that. Uh, I think we need to extend this work on re the reentry group, as Jacob, you noted with your question, like there is there is a pool of people who aren't actually leaving the schools and we need to test the sensitive sensitivity of what we found here, as well as uh, I think there's, I mean, that's a big thread to pull on for sure, um, considering the size of the reentering re group. Uh, I think, the last two pieces are really, we, we just need to continue thinking about preparation characteristics, uh, you know, student teaching versus internships. Um, what, there are a whole bunch of other things that preparation does. And I think we want to continue seeking and looking for ways to add that to our models. Same with school accountability data. Texas does lack a school climate survey. So we're constantly looking for best best available proxies of uh, school climate that we can get our hands on. Uh, this is a quick side, side note, but just our team in general produces a whole lot of reporting. Um, and just, uh, the, we, we've highlighted, I'm not gonna walk through all of these things, but we will at the end provide you with a whole bunch of links to all these different data sources that that y'all can explore and take a look at uh, our reporting. We're happy to answer questions at any point, um, but yeah. Final two slides here. So the first one, uh, I, I think the, the retention, the correlations we're seeing between teacher retention and sources of new hires is interesting. We've advanced a little bit beyond the simple paradigm of alternative certification versus traditional certification, but we're still at a correlation. And I think we just have lots of lots of thoughts, but we'd love to also engage with the audience about what reflections, questions, thoughts, ideas do you have that might connect teacher certification to teacher retention and specifically maybe cut through a little bit of the noise to get at the heart of like what's causing what we're finding in this data. Uh, and then the second thing, and I, I mentioned this previously, and of course, I've, we fixed this like three times, uh, but this slide just continues not cooperating. Um, teachers, we, we see this huge teacher reentry pool, but we have a really limited amount of information about them. We, we would love to know more about who they are. Can we predict who a reenterer might be? Uh, and if we can't, what, in, what additional information might we need to better understand this like very large pool of people who kind of are moving back and forth between jobs within the public school system as teachers. And that's that's all we have here. We just I would like to say before we open the floor for questions, really appreciate the opportunity to engage in conversation. Uh, with this group today and uh, happy to happy to answer questions, happy to like let people talk talk to each other and for us to be listeners. What, however we want to approach this, we're happy to engage. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy and Dina. Um, I have a ton of questions, but I'm not going to monopolize the time. So if others um, on the call have questions for um, Dina and Jeremy, please um, chime in. We have 20 minutes for questions. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, I, I work in the, uh, so first of all, thank you to Alex and 
Jessica and, and Jacob for having this. It's quite informative. I work in the educational leadership program and um, you know, we prepare leaders uh, for uh, what they're facing in the schools right now. And a lot of um, your data and what you said is exactly what we're seeing in the field. Um, so just, just a couple of things. So my first question is for the emergency certification, um, has Texas changed how many times they will grant that certification since we're, you know, in that crisis mode or whatever, or is, has it stayed the same? There, there's been no change in those rules. No change. Okay. And then, um, so from what we are seeing out in the field, and we work with multiple school districts across the state of Texas, um, is that the support system to support new teachers who have not gone through um, student teaching is just not there in schools. Uh, one of the things that we are doing is we're developing um, instructional leaders to be able to do that, but districts and, and, and school systems just don't have the amount of support that someone who comes in who is alt cert or has no cert um, and everything you know the process of schooling they just they just don't have those systems and so the teachers get really frustrated and if they last six weeks or a semester you're lucky um if i mean it's just a revolving door especially in the most in the struggling schools with high poverty high poverty students and so that's some of some of the things that we're, we're seeing so what what we are doing with districts is helping build those instructional leaders that can help build teams to, to provide that system for support for teachers who are coming in because we have a lot of them that are coming in um not to the traditional path so so again your data really confirmed everything that we are seeing with the school districts we're working with and and i'm really excited and took some you know pictures of some of those uh graphs uh, for my students as well so thank you appreciate the comments one one, one thing that i'll just flag for for you um the dashboard tool that we created is gonna allow uh, individual districts to be able to look at their sources of new hires, uh, where they're coming from. Uh, and and what what is that? Does that, Dina, that runs from 2009, 10 on two, right? Yeah, so there will be historical snapshots that districts will be able to take a look at and also think about like, have we seen that like if we have a huge pool of alternative certified teachers coming in or a huge pool of teachers who are not coming from undergraduate pathways, uh, does that mean like, are we seeing changes or is it just a big pool? Does this maybe signal to us that we need to think more carefully about how we're kind of designing our support? Uh, I think all of that and we're hopeful that this tool might help districts be a little more intentional in how they think about it. Yeah, Sean. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I was thinking about the reentry folks, and like my first thought was that you know it's it's largely women in this field, and so. Did we account for like women who are early in their careers and then they start a family so then they step away for a bit and then they come back and then the set just i'm flagging is, is in my role now like that's what i would see here folks i'm in my 11th year of public ed so i've seen a lot of that and then there are folks um two of my buddies like they they are former math teachers and so one went to work for southwest and another went to work for bank of america but now southwest is like struggling and and b of a like the housing market is really cool and for both of them, their 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 thought process was that I could always return to teaching, like I can always fall back. But then now their teachers, it just kind of becomes a fail safe, like a safety net. It's never it, it becomes less. Uh, I'm just offering my perspective as like oh, among uh, male teachers of color that I've spoken with, like they felt like you needed to do more because you need to provide for your family or you're starting a family. But the teaching cert was always a, a fail safe. Uh, so just thinking about that for reentry folks. Those are good. I think I think the so that we've thought a little bit about the uh, the the gendered aspect of that for sure. We do see in our data though that the average age 
of the people who are re-enters. And even if we separate out and get rid of the, the pile of people who are remaining in the schools throughout that process, the average age is going up over the last decade of that group, which is making like at least making me wonder if we're seeing less of uh, uh, females who are who are child rearing ages and having children like is that becoming less of a story than maybe it previously was is kind of at least battering about in my head a little bit I don't know I haven't been able to figure out like where do we go once we've now like sorted out that piece but I think that's uh that that's an interesting kind of offshoot that's coming from that I think uh, to, to your point about it being a fail safe for a lot of people like that that definitely I hadn't thought about that so that makes me think a little bit uh, and I'm monopolizing a little bit Dina feel free to just answer a question and tell me to stop talking I'm just going to answer one of the questions. Uh, do re-entering teachers re-enter the same school district or are they moving? Um, that's a very interesting question that I think definitely um, would be really cool to look at in our future uh, future um, analyses. Um, we've, we've really just wanted to start this analysis by looking at different certification categories and being really thoughtful and meaningful in which variables to include in our model. But as we um, present this data to fellow researchers and, and kind of like get their feedback, we are really interested in, in growing this work for, and moving this work forward and building on this model. So that, that re-entry piece and where they're re-entering would be really interesting to, to look at. I'm curious if you all have plans to dig more into that first year, right? So like, if you look at your hazard models, like everyone drops off huge in the first year, but like, I feel like that's where a majority of the disparity in the overall like levers is at the end, like after year one and a little bit year two is what I was seeing, like years three to four, four to five, like those drops are kind of consistent across the different pathways. So I'm curious if you all have any plans to like look into that. Cause, and I also feel like that ties into like some of the heterogeneity around like alt cert pathways in Texas and like some alt cert pathways come with like lots of support, you know, in years one and two in the intern period. Others are kind of like, there's teaching, have fun. So I'm curious if y'all have any thoughts on that or plan to investigate that empirically or yeah. Dina? Um, I think it would, since we already have this data and it's, it's, it's here, we can, we, can, we can actually look at that first year of, of, of data and, 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 and investigate like what's the probability of, of exit but, but 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 if you look at most research papers, they look at they kind of look at the first three to five years of, of teaching to compare. Um, but definitely, yeah, I see that drop. I mean, among all categories, I mean, it's most dramatic for the uncertified group, but um, there is a significant drop during that first year, and it would be interesting I, to look at. I I mean, I oh, to 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 piggyback at uh, at an end here. Um, I, I I hadn't, I think because we were just so focused on getting to this point, we hadn't like looked at that first year, but that's, I think, a really good thing to point out for, for us to think about because you're right, the steps, the steps do start kind of walking together a little bit more closely after that first year and uh, kind of in the backdrop here. So the SBEC has been having many conversations about uh, high quality preparation versus just preparation. And I do wonder if there's an opportunity now that you say this for us to do a little bit more careful ex exploration of this first year, thinking both about where are people landing? So what districts, as well as like, where are they coming from? Because if there's a story here about preparation quality, uh, that could be, I think, pretty interesting. And I think there would be a receptive audience.
Yeah. The, Other questions? Oh, no. I was just going to add a comment that makes me think of some of the working papers that have come out recently about the effect of Teach for America in particular, and kind of that is such a truncated like two year teaching experience. Um, I think there'd be kind of that that just makes me think again about kind of that first to second year really for many people who depending on the preparation program like brutal entry to teaching um, could be really fruitful to continue to explore. I don't, I will ask this question as like the politics of education person. And if you don't want to answer it as the TEA person, we'll just move right on. Um, but I'm definitely interested in sort of what the emerging evidence about the different types of preparation and preparation and high quality preparation being maybe two distinct activities. And I think the um, desire to maybe move towards a le even less regulated teacher preparation environment in the state. Um, I'm, I'm interested in just, that conversation that you're having and kind of how you think about sharing the data that you have. And if you don't want to answer that, totally fine. Yeah, I, I mean, I can I can answer like what I'm observing internally. I, I'm not, I, I think, I think, you know, our findings, like, I think it's pretty clear certification is a signal of something. Now, like, I'm not going to go as far as to say there's a like preparation is the cause of these differences. It might just be uh, that we're observing a whole bunch like there's a mess of things, but there also is like intention to teach stuff that some costs of like starting to prepare to teach you're spending money to do that. All of those things, I think, are important ingredients. Uh, to kind of what's happening but I, like there is not there is no appetite internally for people here to move to a less regulated environment mm. um i i do like i i i should let me backtrack that one one a half step i don't have like i haven't heard any of the conversations but and i don't you know, the SBEC is not talking about conversations as if we need less certification in any way. Um, but I'm not privy to a whole bunch of other conversations that are driving, I think, in the opposite direction here, too. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I have a question. Um, Jeremy and Dina, what about the group? I think you mentioned this, they fall into four categories, right? Like you, you, your first spell, et cetera. What about that first one where it's like you have your certification, but you haven't started teaching yet? Because I, I feel like some of the critique that I've seen in some of the headlines, although they're purely speculative, and I feel like we need data on this because it would be really interesting, is like, are there differences particularly within the alt cert pathway of time to actual teaching, because that in itself is a loss, right? Like for the labor market, like I've gotten my certification, but it takes me like two to three years to find a job that I want and that I'm willing to take. Do y'all have any plans to explore that piece to it? Or do you at least have any sort of idea of the disparities in the number of teachers who are certified? So they, they, you know, this goes to the whole controversy around like characterizing a shortage. Like we have teachers who can teach, but they aren't teaching. Like, do you have any thoughts on that or plans to explore that first group of teachers? So we actually, um, in our uh, new dashboards um, that we, the newly certified and new, new teacher hire dashboards, we actually differentiate those standard certified teachers into direct entry, like those who get their certification and start working. And um, between those who uh, actually are delayed enters, so they have their certification and they, uh, they, they don't work right away. Uh, keeping in mind that our intern certified population has to actually have a teaching position as part of their training. But in our standard certified, we do kind of distinguish or differentiate between those two. And interestingly enough, I did run the same analysis with those broken down categories of direct entry, uh, uh, delayed entry, and the delayed and the direct entries results were pretty, pretty close together. This is why we, we uh, basically, we just 
we compile them together. So we do see uh, so they, they behave in the same way in terms of retention rates and re-entry. There might be an opportunity uh, for us to, to look at uh, alternative CERT pathway teachers in a more uh, robust way than we have up to this point. Uh, so Dina notes that we don't observe an interim certificate until there is an offer of employment on the table. Like that's that's the catalyst for the intern or probationary certificate. But there is a time there is going to be a lapse time between time of enrollment and time that you get that intern certificate. Uh, and that time varies because there are a whole bunch of requirements that people have to hit the mark on that if I remember this right, I haven't presented this in a while, but um, you have to pass, is it both tests? I don't remember if it was both certification exams or one of the two. Um, so you have to pass at least one of the two and you have to hit the benchmark of like number of course hours that, that the state specifies before you can even get an intern certificate. So. I think there's some questions there. Uh, some of some of our analytic work, though, is driven by the questions people are asking internally. Got it. So, is sorry, and one quick clarification. Then we have time for other questions. But like, so do you? Where does the date? Would you have data on that piece to it? Like, so like, if I'm at you know the largest EPP in the state, right? That's not like an institution of higher ed. Like, so I don't see them in like higher ed data. Do you like, and you don't observe them in the SPEC certification data until they already have the certification, like the permit. Or is there a way to backtrack? Like this is when they started the program or anything like that? Yeah, we collect uh, admission, like date record. There. There's an admission record, there's enrollment records. We have a whole bunch of records that like if you were, if you were to pursue a, a research project, uh, I'm more than happy to help you. Uh, I, I don't know if we submit any. I actually, you know what? I take that back. We have submitted the admission records. Uh, Jim, Jim Van Overscheld asked for them. So we would, so I, I know they're in the ERC, but I don't know how the special requests work if they're just individually uh, apportioned. But they're there already, and so it wouldn't be a huge leap if you were to say uh, walk down that path. So feel oh, free to good reach to out. Okay, cool. We have time for one more question. If someone has I, one, I have yeah. a question. Sorry, Jacob. Um, yeah. So you're um, putting out all this data, which is wonderful. But is it going to be used to um, create any type of solutions? I mean, what's, what what would be the purpose in informing you know the state legislators or whoever, SBEC or whoever, if we're not they're not going to do anything about it? Because I mean, I already have a lot of ideas, but you know, I'm I'm just over here, <laughs> a little nobody. Um, so, so I, I can't speak for what what any legislator is going to do, and and the po the politics of of state level like uh po state level policy making is is a complicated complicated space it's not uh it's not here's your data now now make the right choice here i think there are lots of you know texas is a very large state as we all know you have stakeholders that live in spaces that are very far from cities you have some of the largest cities in the country and everything in between. And so uh, to, to kind of back out here, I'm going to, I'm going to punt it to Dina because like, I think this is a good opportunity to talk about who we think is going to use this dashboard. Uh, so Dina, if you want to talk a little bit about like, you can, I think you can mention the communities of practice that we've been having conversations yeah. with and um so we've been in 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 conversations with several communities of practice um the, the Houston communities of practice is one where 
I presented the dashboard at and uh, got some really good feedback and um, a lot of excitement about this data because it hasn't been ever reported in a in a visually um, accessible and uh, and way. And um, also, uh, Jeremy and Mark are heading to Dallas uh, COP on Thursday, I believe, to present the dashboards. We've also been in contact with um, several phil philanthropic uh, associations to talk about this work and gain feedback. So it's really been the, the process of creating these dashboards, updating them is, has been really informed by those uh, communities and, and people that we've been talking to and sharing. And I think that's what's really important is that we want it to answer questions that people want answered. We don't want to assume we we do know and we've had internal conversations and we've had meetings, but we continue to refine and will continue to refine on these on these dashboards through our conversations with uh, with the stakeholders, such as communities of practice, philanthropic associations, and researchers. And, and, and one one more piece of this, like legislature le legislators are responsive to their stakeholders and so like a big part of our strategy here is to try to be very purposeful about raising awareness about this tool that it exists that it provides a lot of good information try to help you know build capacity and train people on how you might use it but we're not here to call balls and strikes like our team itself, as, uh, sorry, we are here to call balls and strikes. We're not here to say, this is our position. This is what we're trying to do. That's our leadership that that is going to be pushing people along that path. So like to, to your point, uh, that's part of our strategy. And the other part of our strategy is just trying to give TEA leadership the best possible data that we can so that th when they are talking to legislators and state boards of education or educator certification, they are able to tell a very clear story about what they think is happening in, a, in you know in the educator pipeline. Jeremy, Dina, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing the lunch hour with us and all of your new cool tools and data. I'm like geeking out about it. Um, please, if you have um, like that set of links or anything um, we can send out to the folks who attended, that would be great. Um, just shoot me an email. This was really, really great. And um, I'm also, I know there was a question in the chat kind of talking about like what you all's role is and like how you kind of straddle both like trying to influence or, or inform research and policy. Um, I'd love to have you in Jessica and I's future. Uh, teacher labor markets class um, that we're going to we're developing and hopefully we'll have you both um, come present at. So anyway, uh, thank you all um, for coming to our expanded. Uh, this recording will be posted. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Jeremy and Dina. Bye, everyone.